Hello, I'm Justine Brown. Welcome back to my bookshelf. It's been quite some months since I've made a video, but I've been working on a book about James II, about which more later. Please do subscribe to this channel and um, like this video and especially comment below. Today I'm talking about why uh, Charles II and James II tried to centralize New England under the banner of the Dominion of New England and how that came to fail. In the United States of America, a republic for which 1776 is year one, the entity known as the Dominion of New England gets short shrift. Libertarian scion Murray, Murray Rothbard writes scathingly about this 1685 effort to meld the several Puritan-led settlements into one super colony under a single royal governor. Rothbard peppers his account of the short-lived Stuart experiment in his book, Conceived in Liberty, with much talk of autocracy and tyranny. He reserves particular scorn for the Dominion's second governor, Stuart loyalist Sir Edmund Andros. Rothbard deems Andros a perfect instrument of what he considers the arbitrary rule of James II and VII. Rothbard condemns the governor, for example, for imposing, his words, a degree of religious toleration in the Massachusetts Bay Colony because he introduced Anglican practice at a Boston meeting house infuriating the local majority. Rothbard's account leaves us in no doubt as to his sympathies. The revolutions of 1688 and 1776 were the fruit of the Roundhead cause, which abolished kingship in favor of Parliament. For Ra Rothbard and other Whiggish historians, that fruit was sweet. We have seen in earlier videos that the early English colonies in America are in several respects an expression of the English Civil Wars. While the southern settlements such as Virginia and Maryland um, leaned heavily cavalier, the colonies of New England were decidedly roundhead. New England issued a stream of pamphlets and soldiers in support of the Parliament side. Once the Stuart monarchy was restored in 1660, however, Charles II and his brother James, Duke of York, were quick to reward loyal colonists and wrangle, if not punish, enemies, and New Englanders felt that royal displeasure keenly. The Stuart King's reason for consolidating the New England colonies, also known as plantations, was to reorient and harness hostile territories in service of the crown. After all, their purpose, from the government's point of view, was to benefit the mother country. Massachusetts was settled in the run-up to the English Civil Wars by Puritans who opposed James I and VI's religious policy. They desired Calvinist reforms to transform the English Church. The radical group were permitted to leave England for three reasons. One, Puritans like they caused uh, trouble at home, so the authorities took the opportunity to keep them at arm's length. They were thought to be better off settling America rather than growing the dissident community in England or Holland nearby, which lay too close for comfort. Two, the colonists could help develop English trade with native tribes in lucrative commodities like fur. Three, colonies could serve the government as laboratories, trialing experimental, religious, and therefore political arrangements at a safe distance. The difficulty arose when the Massachusetts Bay Colony in particular became successful enough to support the parliamentary war effort despite the distance. Planters were not too busy building the city on the hill to produce ideologically charged rhetoric, godly poetry and pamphlets for the war effort across the Atlantic. For them, the New England project and the Old England conflict were indivisible. 
the colonies incubated the most radical ideas and produced vigorously Puritan soldiers for the fight against royal power. A prominent example is Sir Henry Vane the Younger, who served as colonial governor in Boston, uh, returning to England in 1639 and avowed anti-cleric. Despite being knighted by Charles I upon his return, Vane joined forces with Oliver Cromwell as battle lines were being drawn. Having helped carve New England out of the wilderness, Vane was among the throng eager to remake no, New in Old England rather, in its image. Colonists surged back in great numbers as the war heated up, helping to turn the tide in favor of Parliament. For over a century, New England would rely more on multiplication than migration to grow its populace. The year 1650, on the heels of the regicide that shook Christendom, saw the publication of a book of poems by New England's Anne Bradstreet. The Tenth Muse lately sprung up in America was a natural fit for the new order of things. It sold briskly in Commonwealth England, becoming extremely popular. In the Civil War poem, Dialogue Between Old England and New, Bradstreet personifies the two realms. The afflicted mother country admits shamefacedly to her spotless daughter that, quote, the breach of sacred laws, idolatry, supplanter of a nation, with foolish superstitious adoration, are liked and countenanced by men of might, unquote. The poetess even has Old England apologize for having earlier mocked the New England project, quote, And thou, poor soul, was jeered among the rest. Thy flying for the truth, I made a jest, unquote. In another poem, the epic Four Monarchies, Bradstreet alludes to the vision in the book of Daniel, particularly favored by radical Puritans. Daniel describes a dream symbolizing the succession of empires, Assyrian, Persian, Grecian, and Roman. Radical sects believe it was their mission to usher in the fifth empire, hence fifth monarchists. Indeed, it was the insurgent fifth monarchy men who argued that by dispatching Charles I, they had brought an end to the Roman kingdom and inaugurated the reign of King Jesus. Ultimately judging Cromwell insufficiently committed to, quote, godly revolution, unquote, the fifth monarchists in parliament opposed him from 1653 onwards with one faction plotting armed resistance. The radical spirit of New England now infused the English Republic. Once the roundhead side triumphed, even more Puritan colonists returned to the old country, as Chesterton puts it, quote, to found New England here, unquote. America's influence on the British Isles stems from the very earliest colonial period. The Stuarts had imagined that by permitting these dissidents to form American colonies, they were ridding themselves of a problem. But the civil wars and aftermath showed how far this was from being the case. When the restoration came in May 1660, Puritan New Englanders mourned it. The Massachusetts Bay Colony was after all a place where flying even the St. George's flag was controversial. Many denounced the traditional Red Cross as papist idolatry. New Haven's leaders dragged their feet for a year before acknowledging the king's reinstallment. Charles II was increasingly disturbed by this enmity. Relations worsened further when the roundhead aligned colonies welcomed the king's bitterest enemies. Charles II had promised clemency for most who had fought for parliament. He accepted the regicides, the 59 men who had signed his father's death warrant in 1649. Of these, 41 were still alive in 1660. Post-restoration, even dead regicides, such as Oliver Cromwell, were being dug up and hanged publicly in London. 
King killers faced the gruesome death of a traitor, hanging, drawing, and quartering, though some were spared that fate. Many regicides hastened across the channel, but three of them, John Dixwell, William Goff, and Edward Wally, fled across the Atlantic and into the warm embrace of New Englanders, who sheltered the fugitives so effectively that they were never found by the men sent to hunt them down. The regicides were harbored in Boston first. Later, two of them traveled to New Haven Colony, hotly pursued by the King's detectives. The Puritan clergyman who founded New Haven, John Davenport, preached a sermon urging his congregation to shelter the runaways. The colonists obeyed. Dixwell, Goff, and Wally owed their lives to these local people. It was evident to the Stuarts, even then, that rebellion itself was baked into the American ethos in the northern colonies, at any rate. By 1776, the Cavalier colonies of the South would catch that cold as well. In the words of 19th century historian John Fiske, the king, Charles II, quote, had good reason to feel that the governments of New England were assuming too many airs of sovereignty, unquote. In addition to first sustaining the Roundhead cause and then harboring the regicides, Massachusetts further angered their king by minting their own currency, one of the prerogatives of legitimate government. The alternative was barter, using English coins, and using foreign currency. By establishing a mint, the colonists were effectively claiming sovereignty. Beginning in 1652, they had issued four types of silver coins which bore no acknowledgement of England, only Massachusetts on one side and New England on the other. The mint master, John Hull, was a Harvard benefactor and founder of the Old South Church in Boston. He issued a statement that, quote, all persons whatsoever have liberty to bring the mint house to the mint house at Boston, all bullion, plate, or Spanish coin, there to be melted down and brought to sterling silver, unquote. The colonists persisted in issuing various coins after the Restoration. Despite the small nod Hull made to the monarchy, adorning the 1660 coins with an oak tree instead of a willow or pine, Charles was not impressed. He ordered the colonists to close the mint, but they didn't. Meanwhile, the king extended English influence in America. In 1664, he gave his brother James, Duke of York and Lord High Admiral, patents to a vast swathe of land on the eastern seaboard, the area between the Delaware and Connecticut rivers. A diligent administrator with a large staff that included Samuel Pepys, James built up the Royal Navy that made the British Empire. One major irritant in his new realm was the presence of the thriving Dutch trading colony then known as New Amsterdam. In his memoir, James expressed the view, common to most Englishmen, that this area of the West Indies, that is America, had, quote, always belonged to the crown of England since it was first discovered, unquote. As he saw it, the Dutch had simply taken advantage of the English Civil Wars in order to snatch these lands away and secure the lucrative fur trade for themselves. The Duke of York was now spurred to win the Anglo-Dutch War, which he promptly did. There were celebratory poems by John Dryden and one William Smith, who describes James's fleet dominating the waves, personified by the sea nymph Thetis. Neptune himself is outflanked by Stuart power here. Now is his royal highness out at sea and wondering Thetis, amazed to see, whole forests float upon her face, whilst her soft bosom moving castles grace. Neptune's displeased to find his tritons caught within a wooden city, laboring sought to make his escape, cries out, here's one that reigns o'er me and binds my vaster arms in chains. Here's he who rules as far as winds do blow upon my surface go, whose weighty navies make my shoulders crack, 
whose daring subjects plow my ample back, who have touched all by their discoveries, that rising or that setting Phoebus sees. It is early days for the British Empire here, and yet the sun already scarce sets upon it. As part of the peace treaty, England retook the contested American territory. New Amsterdam was renamed in honor of its new Lord Proprietor, and James Duke of York received a plan of New York to display in his Whitehall office. Neighboring New England's defiant money minting contributed to the King's decision to supplant the strict Calvinist government of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, introduce toleration of non-Puritans, and streamline trade. The Dominion was designed to centralize authority, bringing antagonistic colonies into line with friendly ones. The Boston colonists resisted Charles's efforts, and he revoked their charter the following year. Nearby Plymouth Colony had never had a formal charter. When Charles died in 1685, James succeeded to the throne. The new king was careful to implement his brother's plan for the region. He swiftly inaugurated the Dominion of New England, consisting of the Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth colonies, Connecticut, the Rhode Island and Providence plantations, New Hampshire, and Vermont. From May 1688, it came to enfold New York, part of Maine and East and West Jersey. King James provisionally appointed a Massachusetts-born dignitary, Harvard man Joseph Dudley, as governor. He struggled with a resistant Puritan populace. The king then brought in Sir Edmund Andros, the man so maligned by Whig historians. Andros's royalist roots made him a natural choice. His family had remained true to the Stuarts through the pressures of the Commonwealth period. He had served as a page in the household of Elizabeth Stuart, the Winter Queen. Andros was also a seasoned governor, having been selected by James to leave New York in 1674, and he had been a success there. Amongst other things, he had negotiated a series of treaties with the Iroquois Confederacy. Arriving in Boston in 1686, Andros immediately set about making room for Anglican practice in the fiercely Puritan colony, something Dudley had tried and failed. Actually, it was Andros's duty to do so, as Anglicanism, also known as Episcopalianism, was after all England's state religion, but it brought the governor into direct conflict with the colony's founding principles. Anglicanism was precisely what local Puritans had left their homeland at great personal cost to escape from. The entire New England edifice, the colonists' self-understanding, was built upon the rejection of what they considered corrupt church rights and customs, and therefore government. It seemed to local Puritans that Andros was taking an axe to the roots of their entire project. When the governor asked one local pastor after another for permission to hold Church of England services in his meeting house, they all refused. When Andros demanded the key to Boston's third church, the majority were outraged. Despite this, services proceeded until the king's chapel could be constructed. Sir Edmund Andros's sustained effort to harmonize colonial law ultimately came to nothing. New Englanders were too used to governing themselves and, in a fashion, inextricable from Puritanism. The Stuart centralizing plan did run rough roughshod over the founding particularities of each colony, but then those two political regimes were at odds from the beginning. When King James lost his crown to William of Orange in the 1688 so-called Glorious Revolution, the rebellion rapidly spread to New England, and Andros was toppled as well in the Boston Revolt. The nascent Dominion of New England was relegated to obscurity as the Whigs gained ground on both sides of the Atlantic. The American Revolution was over eight decades off, but in a sense, it was already inscribed.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, again, please do subscribe, like, and comment down below. I look forward to hearing from you, and I will speak to you next time.